Well, just a couple days ago, we got the next major update for Windows 10 with lots of new features. And as you know, they release a major update every six months or so now. And this one is being called the Windows 10 April Update, even though they just barely made it into April. It was released on the last day of April, but they released some pretty cool features. We're gonna go over the most significant and best ones in my opinion, and there's about 10 of them or so. I think you're gonna find this pretty interesting. Let's get started. Starting off, probably the biggest feature that they released is the timeline feature. Now you can access this by clicking the task view button in the taskbar, and if that doesn't show up, you can right click and hit show task view button, or you can also hit windows button plus tab, and then that will bring up the timeline. And basically what this does is will show you a history of your activity in Windows, so the stuff you did yesterday, a few days ago, whether that's documents you opened, apps you've been using. So basically the idea is that if you're working on a project or multiple projects, you can kind of continue where you left off and be reminded, oh, this is what I was doing and start working on that stuff again. And another big part of this is that you can sync this timeline between all your Windows devices, assuming you're tying a Microsoft account to them. So say you have a laptop and a desktop or a work computer and you're working on some projects on one and then you can actually sync all that stuff over to your desktop and work at home, and then it'll show the timeline and all that stuff as well. Now, the thing is that most of this stuff works best with Windows apps or Microsoft-owned apps, so that's Microsoft Edge or Microsoft Office products, and syncing specifically with OneDrive. So if you're not really using any of that, it might not be that useful, but if you are doing a lot of documents and stuff, and you are syncing with OneDrive between all your devices, this could very well be useful. Now, if you don't really like the idea of this, you can actually enable and disable it by going to Settings, Privacy, and then Active History, and then you'll see two options at the top. One is for collecting data, using Windows to collect your activity, and if you disable the top one, it basically just disables the timeline altogether. And the second checkbox will enable or disable syncing between devices. Now, me personally, I don't really use many other devices with Windows 10, so I just don't have it syncing, and I don't really want that activity to be uploaded to Microsoft servers just as a privacy thing. So you can enable or disable whatever you want. Me personally, what I probably see the timeline feature being most useful for is basically a glorified recent documents feature. So if you're working on a document and you close it, then it might be easier to navigate through the timeline to find that document again, as opposed to going through the ex Windows Explorer and finding the file or something like that. So it depends on how you're gonna use it. Next up, this feature has to do with privacy. And if you've ever been wondering exactly what data Microsoft has been collecting on you through Windows, this will allow you to see that. It's called the Diagnostic Data Viewer. To get to it, you go to Settings, Privacy, Diagnostics, and Feedback, and then it will allow you to go to that app, which is in the App Store, and then download and install it, and then it'll show you all the formatted data that it's been collecting, and you can look through it if you want. Probably not that useful for most people. It's a lot of very code-like stuff, and a lot of just random data that might not be meaningful to anyone, but it's still nice that you can actually see what it is. And if you ever want to delete all that data they collected, you can actually go back into that same settings menu and click delete diagnostic data, and then it will supposedly all be gone. All right, now the next few features have to do with graphic settings, and these are actually pretty exciting in my opinion. The first one will allow you to individually control the graphics and power attributed to individual apps, which you couldn't really do before. So to get to that, you go to settings and then display and then click graphics options. And it will actually allow you to browse and select individual EXE files for different apps and then select how you want that individual app to be performing. So you could have it in power saving mode if you don't really need it to have a lot of graphics performance or maybe if you're playing a video game and anytime you're playing that game, you want that specific app to have the highest power attributed to it when maybe not necessarily you need everything else in the system to have that. So that's really cool. I'm probably gonna be using that a while, at least in a few of my games. 
Next, also back in the display settings is advanced scaling settings. So this is good for people who have like a 4K monitor or a higher resolution monitor where you, you enable scaling. So it actually makes things larger. And you might know that not all apps really work well with this. They're not really developed for that and they look kind of blurry. So Windows actually introduced this feature that will try and fix the blurriness that some apps have that might not be super compatible with scaling and high resolution displays. And it does say it only works on the main monitor and also it might not work every time, but still it's nice that they introduced that feature in the first place. Also with scaling, you can actually set a custom scaling now. So before you had to pick from a few preset scaling options, but now if you want, you can choose literally any scaling percentage you want, especially good if you have like an enormous 5K monitor or something like that. And finally for graphic settings, we have some new HDR options, which are pretty cool. So this is now called HDR slash WCG or wide color gamut options to toggle on and off. I think it used to be called like deep color or something like that. But really the main new feature here is the ability to select the brightness on that HDR monitor. So before, if you ever had an HDR monitor and you tried to enable HDR on it in Windows all the time, it would look very dark because the set brightness point in HDR is a lot lower relatively than in standard definition. So it would make things look dark, but now you can actually compensate for that and raise the brightness. It's still gonna look weird, especially if you have multiple monitors, it's not really gonna match up. So it probably still isn't best to enable HDR and wide color gamut all the time in Windows, but maybe if you do like the way it looks and it's your only monitor, it might be something you can enable now and it won't look super dark. All right, moving on. This next one isn't that major at all, but it's still kind of cool. It has to do with fonts. And that is now you can go into the Windows Store and actually download fonts that you might not have had before. There's really not that many. Most of them are free on there. There's a couple that are like $2. So I'm assuming they're gonna be adding more over time. And it might be useful for some like really common fonts that maybe people don't have like Helvetica, although I don't believe that one's free. And then also another small thing is there's a new fonts menu in the settings that you can look at and see all the fonts you have and a preview of all of them. And then that will also allow you to search for different fonts that might be on the Windows Store. All right, next up, this one's actually pretty big in my opinion at least, and that's a new audio settings menu. So to get to this, you go to system settings, then sound, and then app volume and device preferences. And this will allow you to control the sounds of individual apps, the volume levels, although it will only show apps that are either currently playing songs or sound or recently did. And while you can basically do the same thing by right clicking on the sound icon and going to volume mixer, which is not a new feature, this sound options menu does have some new features that are pretty awesome in my opinion. Specifically, this allows you to change the input and output devices on different apps individually, all from one menu. So of course, before you could do this, if you went into each individual app's settings, so if you're running the app like in iTunes, of course it lets you choose which device you wanna to output to maybe, but this allows you to do that right in Windows, all from one place. You don't have to dig into each app settings and it's just more convenient. And it's also good if an app doesn't let you change that, it only by default uses the standard Windows output, this will allow you to customize that. Okay, next, this one's another relatively small one, but also very useful, and that's a new startup settings menu. So of course, you could go into the task manager before, but if you want a maybe easier way to do this, you can actually go into settings, apps, and then startup, and then it'll just show you all the apps that start up with Windows, and if the impact is high or low, if it was measured or not, and then it's pretty simple. You're gonna just enable it or disable it right from there. All right, next up, this is a pretty significant one, I think, and that is nearby sharing. And to enable this, you go to system settings and then shared experiences, and you can toggle it on and off there. And basically this allows you, like you would expect from the name, to share files or information between computers that are nearby or maybe on the same Wi-Fi network as you. So this is good, obviously, if you have multiple computers or you wanna send it something to a friend. What you can do is in Windows Explorer, right click and then hit share, and then it will allow you to send it to nearby devices that also have sharing enabled. 
And also you can do a similar thing in Microsoft Edge, the browser. There's a little share icon, so maybe you can send web pages to someone to share it with them. So it's just another option, and I think it could definitely be useful in some situations. Okay, moving on. This next feature is gonna be great if you've ever been annoyed by the little pop-ups for notifications in Windows, and this is called Focus Assist. And this allows you to restrict which notifications show up during certain times. And you can toggle that on whenever, whenever you want. And you can choose whether it's only priority apps, and then you can choose which apps those are, or no notifications at all. And to get this, you go to settings, then system, and then focus assist, and that will allow you to change all those settings that I just mentioned. All right, we got a few more. This next one's kind of small, but some of you might find it super useful, and that is delivery optimization settings. So this actually allows you to limit the amount of bandwidth that updates can use. So maybe if you don't have a huge fast internet connection, this will allow you to not slow everything down when it's auto updating. And to get to this, you go to the Windows Update settings and then Advanced Options, and then it'll show you Delivery Optimization settings. And then you can also go to Advanced Options in that and then see all those settings for limiting the bandwidth and also a monthly quota. So if you have a bandwidth cap, that's also super useful. All right, now finally, we got a few advanced features that most people are gonna not even know what the heck they are, but some of you might think it's a big deal. And the first option is that the command line now supports the tar command for packing and unpacking tar files. If you've ever used Linux, you know this is kind of a common uh, packing format, compression format, so now you can actually use it right in Windows in the command line. Another new command option is the curl command. And if you don't know what that is, don't really worry about it. And also now Windows does support an open SSH client and server by default. So that's all pretty cool. So those are all the new features that I wanted to talk about. There is actually one feature that was removed that I thought was worth mentioning, and that is home group. So you can no longer create a new home group. It's kind of obsolete at this point, I guess, from the whole sharing thing. So if you're looking for that feature, it's gone in this new update. So that is it. Let me know what you think down in the comments. If there's a big new feature that I somehow missed, let us know, and we can talk about that down there. If you want to keep watching, I'll put some other videos right here. You can just click on those. And if you want to subscribe, I make a few new videos every week. Again, thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Have a good one.